Yeah, excellent. So we live in a, in a time of great uncertainty, uh, uncertainty at the moment. We are experiencing political restlessness. We are, we see clearly around the globe trouble between nations, um, between various groups. We are currently in the middle of a, of a pandemic. We hear rumours of, of other viruses. We're starting to see lawlessness. We're starting to see, well, for, for some time now, we have seen the majority of, of mankind doing what is right in their own eyes. So why admit, amidst all of this turmoil, should we be concerned with what God promised to King David many years ago? Why are these promises important and why do they still matter right here in the year 2020? We will see tonight that in a world of darkness, these promises are the only real thing that we can grasp that gives us any light and a, and a clear hope for the future. Before we look at these promises that God made to David and why these promises uh, matter today, let's briefly consider who David was and, and how important he is in the pages of the Bible. So our first passage um, tonight um, is, is this. Uh, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1. So here, right at the start of the New Testament, um, Matthew chapter 1, this introduces us to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also mentions two other important characters, Abraham and David. Abraham was equally important because he was also given special promises. And the promises that God gave to Abraham were about the nation of Israel being formed and given a land. And these promises then look forward to the return of the Lord Jesus and his look forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and his return and how that we can share in those promises. And this verse is saying that David is, is just as important as Abraham. That of all the characters that Jesus was a descendant of, Abraham and David are the, are the two main ones. And we will see, see why shortly. And notice verse 6 of uh, Matthew chapter 1. And Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So here we're told that Jesse was David's father that David is referred to as David the king twice in this verse. Now even though all the characters mentioned in Matthew chapter 1 were kings of Israel or Judah, it's only David that special mention is made that he was a king. So in the first book of the Bible we are introduced to many important characters. One of those is Abraham and God gave him great promises how his seed would be made into a great nation, which would cover the whole earth. And that seed would become a nation, the nation of Israel, and they would be God's chosen people. They were to be a witness and to give evidence to the existence of God and, and, to, and to his plan and purpose. Now, a thousand years after God gave those promises to Abraham, a, a new period begins on the chosen land and the people. Now, now, prior to this dawn of a new era, there had been a time of darkness, a time of, of lawlessness, only really broken by a brief glimmer of light. And this time is recorded for us in, in the book of the Judges. But now, during the time of Samuel the prophet's reformation, a baby was born in Bethlehem, Judea. He was born into a large family living on the pasture land of the, of the hill country of Judah, just south of Jerusalem. And this baby was David. Now history flowed in his veins, the history of Abraham's children from going down into Egypt, right through to the deliverance and the wanderings in the wilderness. And then finally onto the inheritance of God's land. And David would become the father of, of a new history for Israel. Because by David, Israel would have a point of reference. They would have a, a standard of comparison by which others would stand or fall. 
And the point of reference for all the future generations of the, of the royal house of Judah was, were they doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord their God, like David their father? So of all the characters that we find in the, in the Bible, we hold David in very high esteem. When we read our Bibles, we find that David also had, had the uh, stamp of approval from God. Um, we read in Acts chapter 13, we have um, uh, this um, passage. So Acts chapter 13 and verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave the testimony. And I said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. We also find that after David's life had come to an end, Almighty God was pleased to be known as the God of David. Now, when we consider the, the times in which we live, we can clearly see that the world is, is really short on, on really inspirational leaders, on, on a real um, uh, leaders that can see nations and people through all of the world's problems. We see world leaders and politicians having great difficulty in dealing with very challenging circumstances. We have the current pandemic, there's conflicts, there's protests, there's natural disasters, there's the beginnings of lawlessness. When we read the Bible, we find David is the people's hero. He is the giant slayer, he is the outlaw. But he was also a man loved by his friends. He was a, a master statesman, he was a kingdom builder, he was a musician, an inspired poet, and an organiser of temple worship. But like you and me, David was also a sinner. And we have diff various incidents recorded for us in the Bible, but there was one incident in particular um, we have recorded of David where he gave opportunity for other men to mock and to blaspheme God. So this means that David was like all men, like you and me, we all sin and come short of the glory of God. Despite all of this interesting and quite uplifting detail we have on David, it is the promises that God gave him that is vitally important for us in the times in which we live. Now, David became the king of Israel. To, to, he led the house of Judah and he came to the golden promises of, of another king to come, a king for whom was reserved the throne of the Lord in Jerusalem. So let's now take a, a quick look at how David became king and then the promises that God gave him. So in the first book of Samuel, following a time of, of darkness, we find that the people want a king to lead them. Now the nation of Israel choose Saul as king. But, but this, is, this was not what God had planned for them. Uh, and, but God does give them what they want. And Saul is chosen. And after initially appearing to follow God, he eventually disobeys God. And we find Samuel saying um, these words to Saul in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 13. And Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandments of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Saul also disobeyed God in in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And we find some similar words in that chapter. First of all, verse 26, thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Then verse 28, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine 
that is better than thou. So because of Saul's disobeying God's command, Saul's kingdom would not continue. God had rejected him from being king. And as Samuel says, the kingdom will be given to a neighbour who was better than Saul. And that neighbour would eventually be David. As we move on to the next chapter in the first book of Samuel, we are introduced to David. Samuel is sent out by God to visit Jesse and there God had chosen a king from among the sons of Jesse. So first book of Samuel chapter 16 and a few verses that we have picked out of that chapter. First of all, verse seven, and the Lord said unto Samuel, look not on his countenance or on his height, of his, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And Jesse made of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And he sent and brought in David. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him for this is he. So here we see what God places importance on when selecting a godly king. And we see how David is brought into the Bible record. Now this principle is backed up for us throughout the Bible. It's not the outward appearance that matters, but God looks on the heart. Now if we contrast that principle with what we see in the world and what we see in society today, I would say that more than in any other age of, of history, we live in the time where it is all about the outward appearance. We see so many things um, where everybody is all about what they look like, what they are doing, what they are showing they are doing to other people. And it's all fueled by this social media bombardment. So as we discover a little of the character of David, think about Jesus and try to think about how David is pointing forwards to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just in terms of the promises that um, David was given that was pointing forwards to the Lord Jesus, but also aspects of his character, what he did, the type of leader that he was. So God then looked on the heart and not on the outward appearance. And when David was brought before Samuel, he had been tending the sheep. He hadn't really time to get ready to prepare himself for this meeting, but he was the man after God's own heart. Back in Samuel 1, uh, first book of Samuel chapter 13, when Saul had angered God for not obeying God's commandments, Saul's heart was not right before God. But David was a man after God's own heart. Now, let's jump forward quite a bit in the story of David and let's go now to, to the end of his life, not long before David's death. And we find these words of David to his son Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Now, David prepared abundantly before his death, and then he called for Solomon, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord, my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because... Thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. So David had, had wanted to build a temple for God, a house to dwell in where God could be praised. But God instructed David that he, he wasn't to carry out this task. David had fought in many wars. He had shed blood many times. And even those battles and those wars have been fought in God's name. God doesn't take pleasure in these wars and the fact that even though they have been fought because they have been fighting in his name and it's because of this that David couldn't build a house for God this is not a criticism of David that he couldn't build the temple 
but it's the promises that God gave to him that are important. From David's fight with Goliath and his many other challenges and battles he fought, we can see that David was a man of integrity. He had great faith and he put his trust completely in God. He was loyal to those who were close to him. He was courageous in battle and a fierce warrior. Now, this is the man then that God gave great and precious promises to over 3000 years ago. Promises that are vitally important to you and me now, sitting in our in our houses, experiencing this pandemic in the year 2020. Now, the place where we find the promises given to David is the passage that I read at the beginning to introduce the subject, the second book of Samuel in chapter seven. Now, David has been king for a, a while now. Um, he's been given rest from his enemies. The nation of Israel is not at war at this point in David's life. Let's just recap a few of these um, verses. Second book of Samuel and chapter seven. Verse 12, when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So what are the main points here? The main points are that I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, there are other passages that we could go to, to to back up what God is saying to David here in establishing this covenant. And one of them that we could go to is Psalm 89. Let's just look at this brief um, passage here in Psalm 89. It's just really backing up what we have just seen in the second book of Samuel. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant, thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Again, we have the, the same ideas that God would establish David's seed forever, that he would build up David's throne to all generations. And the main question that we need to, to answer um, is, who is the seed of David uh, from 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12? Is it his son Solomon? Well, no, we, we clearly see that it is definitely not Solomon because the kingdom of the seed was to be an everlasting kingdom which Solomon was not. Now it's clear that the seed is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ and there are many passages that back up what uh, the back up this this idea. First of all we have um, a prophecy uh, of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, um, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. We also have three other um, short passages. Revelation 22, Jesus said, I am the offspring of David. Romans chapter 1, verse 3, Jesus made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And finally, Acts chapter 13, 
of this man's seed, David's, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a saviour, Jesus. So once we've identified then that the seed is the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can quickly discover some significant details. So firstly, the uh, seed. The seed had to be a literal descendant of David. And th at the same time, God had to be the father. And the only way then for this promise to be fulfilled is the virgin birth. When we read Luke chapter 1 and verse 32, we find the angel of God coming to Mary and saying to her that she would conceive and bring forth a son and, and, and would call his name Jesus. Now, secondly, we have, we have the house. And as mentioned in, in verse 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 7, He shall build an house for my name. We have two aspects here. Jesus will build both a literal and a spiritual temple. The literal temple will be built in Jerusalem when Jesus has returned. This will be built during the first 1000 years called the millennium. And we can read about that in Ezekiel's prophecy in chapters 40 to 48. Now, the spiritual temple is made up of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and and Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone. If we follow God's ways and commit our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are described as lively stones. And the third um, significant detail that we can take from um, the promises to David is regarding the throne. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, verse 13, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So the first point to note is that the kingdom that Jesus was, was set up when he returns it will be based on David's kingdom of Israel. Secondly, that God's kingdom to come is a re-establishment of the kingdom of Israel. The nation of Israel has been preserved for generations as a witness of God's promises and is central to the hope of the gospel. And we can see that in our news all the time. The nation of Israel is still there. It's still at the, the centre of the news all the time. There's so many things happening around Israel and the, with the Israel and the surrounding nations. And so when Jesus returns and reigns on David's throne in Jerusalem, then that promise will be fulfilled. Now, the final aspect to um, focus on regarding the promises to David is the kingdom. Verse 16 of 2, chap uh, 2 Samuel um, chapter 7, Thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. And this gives us two important points. Firstly, that David would witness the establishment of Christ's eternal kingdom. Secondly, that there is a promise here to David that he would be resurrected at Christ's return to actually see the kingdom being set up. So what was the what is the significance of David? Well I'm sure we have seen what a, a remarkable man David was in so many aspects. He he pointed forward to the work of the Lord Jesus, the fact that he was a shepherd who tended his father's flock. He was anointed and chosen by God to be king over Israel, that he would shepherd the nation. So move forward to consider the Lord Jesus. And we see so many times in the New Testament that Jesus is described as the good shepherd. Uh, Jesus is a, is a shepherd to all who commit their lives to him and look to walk in God's ways. The promises to David were an expansion of the promises that were made to Noah and to Abraham. And the promises were partly fulfilled by Solomon, David's son. But the significance is that 
that they pointed forwards to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God to be established when Jesus returns. Now, I think we can say that David connected the promises that God made to him with the promises that were made to Abraham. Just consider these um, couple of passages. Firstly, Genesis 22 and verses 17 to 18. That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So that in that chapter was a promise um, from God to Abraham. And think about this passage. This is um, God speaking to um, concerning promises to David. For thy people Israel didst thou make thine own people forever, and thou, Lord, becamest their God. Therefore now, Lord, let the thing that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house be established forever. And do as thou hast said, let it even be established that thy name may be magnified forever, saying, the Lord of hosts is the God of Israel, even a God to Israel, and let the house of David thy servant be established before thee. Now, another important point that we can bring out is that David recognised that the promises made to him concerned eternal life and that they were not a reference to his immediate family. Just think about this passage from um, the second book of uh, Samuel and this um, chapter 23. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. So this then is the, rev uh, the relevance of the promises that God gave to David, um, that, that, that God gave to David and why it's relevant to each of us. The everlasting covenant that God made with David. The eternal promises were important to David. They were all of his desire. And they should be all of our desire. They should be just as important to us. They offer us a clear hope. They give us light in a world of darkness and ever increasing lawlessness. Just as David was introduced at exactly the right time to lead the people of Israel and to be a king to them after they had endured difficult times. So we, in the difficult times in which we live, we, we clearly need the return of Jesus. We need Jesus to be to return, to become king, to put right all of the problems in the world and to establish God's kingdom of righteousness. Now, in the book of Psalms, we find um, that many Psalms were written by King David. They were a combination of his thoughts, but they, they were also inspired by God. And these words are written down for us. Now, many of the psalms that David wrote um, are messianic. They are pointing forwards to the Lord Jesus Christ. The promises that God made to the fathers of old in the Old Testament are a, a great source of great encouragement and, and help to those that read and understand God's word. Right from the promise in Eden of one who would win the age-long struggle against sin, the promises to Abraham of a land, of a saviour and a king, to the promise uh, to Israel in the wilderness that the purpose would not fail. And finally, to the promises that we are focused on tonight, to David, of a divine son who would one day rule the world and fulfil all of God's purpose and promises. This theme of the promises of God run throughout the Bible record it's like a recurring pattern. Uh, and these themes and promises, to me, are all brought together in, in one well-known psalm. And this is Psalm 72. The great promises to 
David is echoed in so many of these verses. Let's just take a look at, um, just very briefly, a few of these uh, verses in Psalm 72. Verse 8, he shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Verse 15, he shall live. This is a kind of like a brief way of saying, I shall establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And then we have verse 16. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit, the fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. This then is a description of the earth's future fruitfulness in what are now barren places which is alluding to the house in which he will build for my name in Jerusalem, in the top of the mountains. And this is again taking us back to 2 Samuel chapter 7 and, and the promises again. And then we have the fulfilment of the, of the final promise right at the end of that psalm in verses 19 to 20. Blessed be his glorious name forever and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So it's, it's, it's very fitting that David ends uh, his psalm with these words, that the earth, he was looking forward to the time when the Lord Jesus had returned and the earth would be filled with the glory of God. And for David, there was there was nothing else left to pray for after he had prayed, you know, after he had prayed for, for that promise, for that purpose to be fulfilled. So in these times in which we live, David is a, is a great example for us. At the end of his, of his life, he gave these words to his son Solomon, which are for all who seek almighty God. David said to his son Solomon, My son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. Throughout the generations, there has always been the promise and the hope that the tabernacle of David which had fallen down would be restored and also that the covenant that God made with David would one day become a reality on the earth. Now despite the failure of Solomon and many subsequent kings of Israel we know that a son was born as we saw in Isaiah chapter 9. The Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 23 and verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and justice. Believers and followers of the Lord Jesus can take heart in the patient waiting for the day when the glory shall be restored to the house of David and the king shall sit in Zion and then it will be very clear that the Messiah Jesus the son of God is both the root and the offspring of David 